Hi, I'm Tom Reber and thanks for hanging out here with me today. I want to talk to you about how to not suck at lead generation in your small business, your contracting business. Um, so many contractors this time of year, it's December of 2016 when I'm filming this. This is about the time of year when I start getting phone calls and texts and emails and you know replies through my podcast and all this other stuff from contractors who are freaking out because the phone has stopped ringing. And so if you happen to find yourself in a situation where year after year, your phone really slows down right now, you don't have consistently throw lead flow through the year, then um, the things that we're gonna share here today, four things I'm gonna share with you today, I think are gonna be key in helping you build a stronger business. So the first thing that you've got to get through your head if you're going to have strong lead flow and not suck at generating leads is you have to be, can we even see that? Yeah, can you see that? Hopefully you can see that. It's a new thing, dry racing. you got to be a fanatic about lead generation. I am just blown away by how many guys I talk to, how many business owners I talk to who have no freaking clue how many leads their business needs, how many jobs their business needs, and how I'm really blown away by how little the average contractor is doing to get the phone to ring. So if you want to not suck at lead generation, you have to be a fanatic, you have to be obsessed with it. And I mean obsessed in a good way. I, I believe a minimum Minimum, minimum, minimum. Can I say minimum any more times? Minimum, minimum, minimum. Number of leads that you should be generating in your business is 365 a year. That's one a day, that's child's play. Okay, so if you're half-assing your job as the marketing director, the, the leader of your business, if you're just half-assing it, I think you can generate at least one lead per day from multiple sources, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so there is no easy button for this lead generation thing. It's not like you sign up for Angie's List or you buy, you build a website or hire an SEO company or go to one networking meeting or print some business cards and pass them out. Um, there's no easy button, it just doesn't happen. It takes a lot of hustle. And so if you're not willing to be a fanatic about this, I would encourage you to truly just pack up shop and go work for somebody else. All right, the number one thing, I'm gonna quote uh, Grant Cardone, uh, author, speaker, entrepreneur, billionaire, or not a billionaire, but gazillionaire guy, whatever that is, that's like one step below billionaire or something, whatever Grant is. By the way, Grant, you need to come on this show. Grant says the number one, and I agree, the number one factor that keeps your small business from kicking butt is obscurity. That means nobody knows who you are. And they don't know who you are because you're not fanatical about marketing your business. All right, the second thing that it's gonna take to make sure that you don't suck at lead generation is you need to know your ideal client and what they look like and who they are and how they think and how they make buying decisions. So let me give you an example back to my uh, painting contractor days back in Chicago. When we first started our business, it was before the Great Recession hit and took everyone's legs out. And we were uh, outside of Chicago in one of the fastest growing communities in the country. So there were tons of, you know, these uh, cookie cutter homes going up, small families would move into them, and we became masters at going in and banging out these interior paint jobs because these young moms would take possession of these homes with all these white walls and they would want to make that home their own. And so we went in and there were simple jobs. We never had to paint the trim. There was hardly any repair work. It was just a matter of color and a great experience. And that was our ideal client. We really, really sh uh, shine, shone, shone shine in that arena. But then something happened. 
the recession hit and those younger families that didn't have disposable income started doing things themselves. The equity in their houses were gone. And so over the years, we had to make the shift in our business and uh, identify a new ideal client. Now you can have a few different ideal client personas, but in this one case, uh, by the time uh, 2010, 2011, 2012 roll around, our ideal client was the wife of a executive from the East Coast who was being transferred to Naperville, Illinois. And her number one priority was getting her family set and it was coordinating the movers and it was making this house her home. And so everything we did revolved around making that, um, that woman's life easier. And so we had a lot of great content on the website. We'd send videos and we would send um, tips. Uh, hey, you're moving into town, here's the best sushi place. Here's the best top two rated daycares in town. It was all about her and what was gonna make her life easier and the result was she viewed us as a trusted advisor. The other cool thing is she respected what we brought to the table because she was working with a relocation company and a moving truck was coming with tons of stuff for this massive house she had to make sure that she hired the right company that would have the house totally painted on the inside before that moving truck showed up. And so money was rarely an issue and that was our ideal client. So I want to give you four quick things here. Um, I don't know where I'm going to write it, but uh, these are, are what, how I define an ideal client. Number one, they need or want what I do. Number two, they um, they see the value in what I do. Like the example I just gave to you, that woman saw the value when everyone else was 10 grand and we were 18, 20, $25,000. She knew that we were gonna come through with her and she saw the value in what we did and she wasn't a price shopper. The third thing, okay, is an ideal client is going to find the money. Now, I didn't say they have the money. I'm saying they find the money because you and I both, we always find the money for the things that are important to us. And so her moving her family halfway across the country on God knows how many relocations she's done and how many crappy contractors she's dealt with, we knew that the way to take care of her and grow her business was to make it a great experience. And because of that, she was happy to find the money. Okay, and the fourth thing, I want to enjoy working with people. You know, we all have those customers or those clients that when the phone rings and you see their number, their caller ID, and you go, oh God, I gotta to talk to this guy, I don't want to answer my phone. Raise your hand if you've done it, we've all done it. Okay, we get to choose who we work for. We get to choose. So, you're gonna need and want what I have, you're gonna see the value in what I bring. You're gonna find that money because you got a magic money tree just like I do. And you're gonna be a joy to work with, okay? So to me, that's how I define an ideal client. All right, so we've talked about being a fanatic and driving leads to your business and you being focused on this because that's your number one job as the CEO of your company. We talked about identifying your ideal client Next thing I want to talk about is I'm going to ask you to attack the whole field. What I mean by that is this. I see so many contractors relying on one or two sources for leads. All right. They might have 200 leads coming in a year and they're all from Google. That's a problem. To me, that's a serious problem. In the home improvement space, I believe if more than 50% of your leads are not from past customers and, and local relationships and influencers and networking uh, and referrals, then you got a serious problem. If more than 50, 60% of your leads are just from Google or one source, that's an issue. So what I'd like to see is, you know, here's, God, I wish I could draw a telephone, but I can't. So we're gonna say, here's my phone. And what are all the things that feed into somebody calling us. It's like as a football coach, 
you know, if we can run the ball in the middle, let's run the ball in the middle. If we can run it outside, let's run it outside. If we want to throw deep over the middle, deep to the corners, throw into the flats, run a screen, run a draw, we're going to attack the whole field and make the defense protect the whole field. Well, in the same way with your marketing, attack the whole field. You've got online stuff like Google. Of course you got to be on Google. You've got third party online stuff like Angie's List and Home Advisor. That's third party, okay? You've got social, social media, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. Um, you've got BNI groups, networking groups, local networking, business meetups, things like that. You've got the neighborhood that you're working in. Neighborhood domination is huge. Like, hey, let's plant our flag in this neighborhood. What if you do this? What if, what if on, a, on a Sunday, you're working in a neighborhood and you want to do more work? What if you rented an ice cream truck and put your banners on the side of it and you sent a letter or a mailer to the whole community and put some signs up say, hey, this Sunday, when you hear the ice cream truck, it's free and it's on us. And it's all you did. Imagine the message that would send, okay? Um, you've got influencers really bad here, sorry. An influencer, if I'm a painting contractor, an influencer is gonna be a carpet guy because he's in hundreds of homes a year like I am standing in front of those same people. Who are those, uh, what are those distribution channels for you to, to grow your business? And so we should all have a list of 40, 50 influencers, okay? You've got your past clients. My God, are we neglecting them. Raise your hand if you don't send a monthly snail mail card or letter to your to your past customers. Raise your hand if you're not emailing them on a regular basis and adding value to bring them back to your website. Guys, you have to attack the whole stinking field because if you don't, let's say Google changes its rules again, which they're gonna do, and it goes away, and that was your number one lead source. We have an issue. All right, the fourth thing I want to talk about if you don't want to suck in lead generation in your contracting business is you have to track and measure. You have to track and measure your leads. I want to know every time the phone rings or we get some, someone emailing the company or somebody calls or texts me and says, hey, I want to bid, I want to know how they found us. Guys, if we don't know how people find us, then we're just throwing marketing money away. We're wasting money. What if we realized, and this was actually the case in my business a number of years ago, my influencers Okay, those contractors, other contractors and realtors and home inspectors and things like that, they actually accounted for a little over 50% of my business one year. That's probably important to know so that I can spend some money maybe putting on an event for all my influencers so they get to meet each other. I can um, take them out for wings and a beer or finder's fees or whatever they want, but I need to know that. Maybe you're spending money, I hear this a lot, a lot of people spend money on Google. We have that here, I crossed it out earlier. You know, 900, 1500 bucks a month. If you're not tracking the leads and you don't have clear opt in forms and, and unique phone numbers, you know, if you have a landing page on Google, there should be a unique pass through phone number that it's called so that you can get a report every month to go how many people are picking up the phone and calling from this landing page. All right, if we're not tracking where every lead comes from and then what happens to that lead, through your process, if it turns into work or not, then we're just throwing our money away and we're not able to make wise decisions in our business. All right, so I want to encourage you on this tracking thing. Even if you have to use a simple Excel spreadsheet right now or a notepad, it's better than nothing. Ideally, you're gonna use a CRM system, a customer relationship management system. Okay, the one I particularly use because I believe it has the best features for tracking and measuring is a thing called Estimate Rocket. Make sure we put that in the links, okay, Dakota? All right, so Estimate Rocket is an awesome, awesome tool where you can um, track the lead source, create, you know, the contact track, the lead source, 
Um, you can send proposals, you can send work orders, you can send follow-up emails, um, there's, and, and they continue to add. Uh, nobody is, is moving faster in leveling up their technology, in my opinion, in the CRM world than Estimate Rocket, all right? So, quick recap and we're out of here for today. Be a fanatic, be, be a crazy man or woman when it comes to lead generation. Have a meeting every week and talk about it. Every time the phone rings, we need to know where it came from. Shoot for 365, absolutely minimum, okay? Know who your ideal client is. Take some time, and a great way to do this is ask yourself, who would I like to clone? And write down those four or five or 10 clients, and then look at the commonalities between them. What was, why did they hire you over the other guy? What was important to them? And now you create all of your marketing messaging around their pain or the pleasure, once you get to know who they are. All right, attack the whole field. Don't be a one-dimensional marketer because that's a quick way to go out of business and track and measure so that you can make wise decisions. All right, so I appreciate you. If you've stuck with us this long through this video here today, I appreciate you hanging out. Head over to motorhard.com to get free daily tips on how to grow a stronger contracting business and a bunch more stuff. And uh, again, we'll see you guys next time, Motorhard.